What you do is you marginalize people, you push them out of the civil discourse arena and into the uncivil discourse mm -hmm. arena. They, they take it to the streets, they take it to the abortion clinics and so on. And, and what, that's exactly what we've done with that issue. People say, I don't want to hear about that, I don't want that debated, don't talk about that. Well, talk is a lot better than some of the negative action we have. And so I think you come back to the proper role of, of politics, and I think it has to do with giving young people a knowledge of how to take part in civil society, and they don't, they're not taught that. We downplay uh, what we used to call civics, mm -hmm. political education. Uh, we need to bring that back up and let people know how to take part in these uh, activities so that they don't get into the, the more negative side. Yeah. yeah, John, you've also been engaged in some highly controversial and uh, emotionally charged situations, particularly uh, the black English and education. Without talking about that issue particularly, uh, how do you engender civility in what is clearly such emotion? Well, for one thing, it would, it would help if more people in all societies in this world became comfortable with the fact that there are certain issues, abortion being one of them, where unfortunately it comes down to certain kernels of disagreement which are always going to be there about very basic principles and people should be comfortable with that. A comfortableness, a comfort with agreeing to disagree is something which is often missed. And also sometimes we always need to remember that we need to put ourselves in each other's heads as I always put it. For example, even in the black English debate, on the black side, it's often difficult for black advocates of using black English in schools to realize that a white person who questions this need not necessarily be a racist. On the other hand, it's often difficult for white commentators on the issue to imagine that a black person who is advocating the use of black English in schools isn't dealing with some kind of woolly-headed, you know, anti-constructive, um, quote-unquote, militant, as it used to be called, politics. Mm -hmm. So in basic sympathy, trying to really understand where each other are coming from is important, but can be difficult to do. Sounds like you're criticized by both sides. Fire in the building. Yes, I've been, <laughs> yeah, been on both sides. I guess some, some people would call that a compliment. Yeah, I suppose. But the most important thing that I learned is that despite whatever one's fire in the belly might be, and any human being is going to have it, to try to think above it. You know, you can feel the burning in the pits of your mm. being, but then you think, what is the thought? You know, how am I going to look at this tomorrow? How, what am I going to wish I said in a week? Well, somebody That's who important. has looked at the overview from a very high level continuously, Barbara, you've done that and built a marvelous uh, a career and vision. Uh, tell us a little bit about your vision of conscious evolution and how understanding that in a global sense will give a kind of a new look to the civility situation. Well, it, it exaggerates it to, to a high degree because from my point of view, the human species now has so much power that if we cannot become civil with one another, we can destroy our whole life support system. In other words, it's escalated the danger mm. of uncivility. And it's also uh, driving us toward a global consciousness to survive. My phrase is conscious evolution, becoming aware of our impact, mm. <clears throat> not only in ordinary things, but we understand the gene, we understand the brain, we can start making new life forms, we can clone sheep. That means human consciousness is entering nature. Mm. And I think that ethical evolution will become the key to a future. Mm. Bruce, uh, from cloning sheep, let's talk about politics. Well, in a kind of perverse way, uh, reform has backfired, in my opinion. I used to be a big reformer. I, I believe that if we passed enough laws governing how people would behave, we would, we would do better. I've changed my mind about that. For one thing, I went back and read some of my college Aristotle and realized that virtue, to be virtue, has to be voluntary. It has to be something volitional on your part. If you're forced to be virtuous, uh, and especially in all these little details, you will rebel against it. You will, uh, and, and it's not, it, it's, you're just being compelled to do it. It's like paying your taxes. What's it's not example? virtue. Paying example. your taxes is not virtuous. That's something right. you have to do. Okay. Yeah. So uh, virtue is when you have a, a choice to make. It entails choice. So as we take choices out of politics and we put politicians under more and more strictures, then people of real virtue don't want to be involved. We've destroyed trust in government. The more laws we've passed, the what more, some examples? Give the me more an example. investigations we've had. Okay. Well, we have all these laws about uh, what you may and may not do it with a gratuity. You know, someone who we trust to declare war, we don't trust to accept a lunch from somebody. You know, that's, that's part right. of the problem exactly. is that, you know, there is no inclusion of women or of other groups. I think people feel totally alienated from the political process because it continues to be the same group in their, in their view that rules um, 
in Washington and elsewhere, they feel completely alienated. It's white men, typically, in, in office. So it's a solution. Providing young women with the ability to feel like they can be leaders themselves. We encourage young women in, our, in their community to take action, to then go on and become leaders, to get politically involved. It doesn't happen by, saying, by giving a civics course. or It happens by allowing them to question authority themselves and by giving them the tools to, to take leadership themselves. Can you have civility without economic equality? No, I don't think so, um, because young people feel, mm. they know who the haves and the have-nots are. And as long as they do not feel part of the haves, it's very difficult for them to engage in what mo mainstream society would call ethical behavior, because... Um, Is that an excuse to be unethical? <laughs> I mean. First of all, I wouldn't necessarily call the kinds of behaviors that young people engage in unethical, but I think mainstream society would. And as long as there is that judgment, mm. um, <laughs> young people cannot feel included or um, positive about themselves. There's a lot of lack of self-esteem and therefore inability to take leadership, I think. I think well, in economics, unless there is not just opportunity, but some stakeholder share in the economy, including this high-tech economy, you will have this increasing disparity between the haves and the have-nots, and it ends up in some sort of civil conflict. If you ask me, I agree with, with Sarah that there are people who don't feel included in the community, and that leads to unethical behavior. I would expand that from the young to a great many people. You know, there are, you know, for example, many Latino communities in this country, much of the African-American community. These are situations where the mainstream culture is seen as something outside, and therefore quite naturally, as often as not, something hostile and not to be emulated. And my gloss on what Sarah said is that, yes, there's a great deal of unethical behavior. We could argue that it's not unethical if it's enforced by economic disparity. But still, these things are unethical. But that's not the point. They're going to keep happening unless we work harder to bring the rich and the poor together and to stop this spread. This you know, and I'd like to add the idea that we might have a developed economic system, for example, local currencies are really important where you don't only depend on a job for your income where there's trading, there's bartering, that everybody has work, everybody gets to do something. I think we have to be inventive about the very system itself that's causing inequalities. I want to raise a question about uh, Sarah's uh, strong emphasis on the need to give youth a voice that they don't have. I see most popular culture is very youth oriented. I mean, uh, the, the new TV shows uh, uh, predominantly focus on, on youth. If all you need, at any given moment, turn on MTV and you see very angry expressions of, of a youth culture and what many of us in the mainstream culture would consider to be alternative lifestyles being displayed as, as perfectly acceptable and, and normal. Okay, but what kind of political power does that give young people or what kind of economic power for that matter? None. It provides them perhaps with some forms of tools, many of which are self-destructive. Um, violence and the media and those kinds of things, but provides them with no positive alternatives or no positive tools to really take leadership or take power or feel included. Well, what, when, when the whole market is geared toward uh, a youth culture and commodifying of a youth culture, mm. wh where is the, what are the issues there? See, you may see the market as reflecting what young people want. I see the young people reflecting what the market is trying to sell them, which is violence, which is sexism, racism, um, body image in, in a large way for our young women. Um, Trying to the, the, the market did not create baggy clothes. Uh, the market commodified well, baggy clothes. I would venture I, to say that the, the sorts of things that you're talking about maybe stand out and they get a lot of media coverage, but I will make the extreme statement that in t if you watch a lot of TV and if you really follow what movies are coming out, not just the big hits, but what's there, you see just about every conceivable aspect of every conceivable kind of young person in this society covered. Nice white people, bad white people, inner city thugs, inner city people getting along, middle class black young people. You really see the whole thing. It's easy for us sitting here to say, oh, the culture reflects youth. Um, but in what way are they being included in this discussion? What would be the powerful way for youth to be reflected in all of these movies? Yeah, what do you want? What's the solution? What do you want? I want young people to be able to deconstruct what they see in the media and take action in their real lives, not in their media well, first lives. First, you've got to tell them what I, deconstruct I, means. My, my, my <laughs> Our young women know. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the first step, point. If my, that's right. Yeah. My wife is a high school counselor, and she deals with young people in the inner city every day that come, 